Welcome to Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt, a webcast that explores everything we currently know about the truth about aliens, human history, reality, consciousness, and the role meditation can do to help us understand all these things, and how we might all work together to build the best world possible for all beings, human or non-human alike. Meditation and Aliens is hosted by me, Matt Reddy. I'm an amateur ufologist. I have a degree in philosophy. I'm the creator of HiveOne.net. I'm also an elected public hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. Each week, I am joined by Doro Kiley, longtime meditator, meditation teacher, and an experiencer with many stories, and life coach extraordinaire. You can find more about Doro at her website, creationcoach.com. Now, on to the show. And we're back. How you doing, Doro? I'm doing fine. I'm looking forward to this one. I didn't bring anything to the table because I think we could do a whole show on this one. Um, yeah. Today we're going to talk about Carl Nell and the uh, what he said at the Salt Eye Connections Conference in New York, which was just a few days ago, it looks like. Um, and I actually have a, uh, a couple clips I can play so we can just share that absolutely yeah good one really good okay so this is carl colonel carl nell and uh we're not going to read any of his uh we're just going to go straight to what he said he's a military or retired military officer and he was asked if uh non-human intelligence exists on earth and this is i believe i got his first response queued up do you believe that a higher form of non-human intelligence has visited this planet? Right. So non-human intelligence exists. Non-human intelligence has been interacting with humanity. This interaction is not new and it's been ongoing. And there are unelected people in the government that are aware of that. And, and so, Carl, that is quite a bold statement. Um, I'm wondering and I'm curious, how confident are you that that is true? There's zero doubt. And, and Carl, what evidence have you seen? What was the moment where you developed this level of conviction? Because what you're saying is extremely consequential and very important. And I know that a lot of people here even perhaps may not believe that statement. Right. Well, probably a better way to ask that is how can the folks in the audience come to the, you know, a, uh, common understanding of what this phenomenon is. And so there's sort of two tracks here. One is from first principles, and another is actually from the data. So, so let's take a look at the data. So we can look at some folks that have uh, very high level uh, access to information, like uh, Paul Hellyer, who is the defense chief for Canada, has come out and said the same thing. We can look at Ham Eshed, uh, the head of Israel's, or former head of Israel's Space Force, has said the same thing. Chris Mellon, Assistant, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intel, SAPCO, has essentially said the same thing. Lou Elizondo has said the same thing. David Grush has said the same thing. David Grush cleared for presidentially level material. So you're looking at people that are in a position to know this, and they're telling you the same thing. You could take a look at the Gang of Eight in the Senate and in Congress. So there's two members of the Gang of Eight, Marco Rubio and Senator Chuck Schumer, that signed up to the UAP disclosure amendment last year that basically said they're not being told the truth and we need to push forward on that. So that's sort of a, an overview of some of the, the data. From a first principle standpoint, what's so unusual about this um, realization? There's billions of stars in the galaxy. Life here evolved in 500 million years, which is basically a blink of an eye. We found planets around every star that we've looked at. It's likely that the universe is full of life. If you look at the SETI program in particular, the- All right, we'll stop it uh, there, because that was, just what he said there was huge. That was a lot. That's a lot to digest. And, and I did want to mention his credentials because he, you know, some people find that pretty important. I just pulled it up. So it mm -hmm. says here, Colonel uh, Carl E. Nell is an aerospace executive, senior military officer and corporate strategist. 
Ivy League graduate, certified uh, something or other, PMP, something published author, War College alumni. I mean, this just this list goes on and on. Uh, joint qualified commissioned officer of the Army Reserve. So anybody who is questioning his credentials, uh, they are in the <laughs> they're in the box below uh, of this video. So yeah, he's yeah. he's a real deal. Well, um, so is David Grush, decorated yeah. military and intelligence officer, put his you know career on the line. And Christopher Mellon, former, as he said, former Sep Deputy Secretary of Defense, Lou Elizondo, um, and even Chuck Schumer, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, and right. uh, Marco Senator Marco Rubio. And so one thing I want to like emphasize and point out of what he just said, so he listed all those people that I just listed. Right. But all the people I just listed, all the only thing that they have gone on the record saying is that UFOs the Tic Tac, basically flying saucers are real. They know they are real. They know they are uh, advanced technology. They know they, they're they flying around. They know some part of the US government that knows about it. And they, uh, several of them, well, Lou Elizondo, actually, I think only David Grush has gone on the record saying he knows there is a crash retrieval reverse engineering program somewhere hidden within the US government and um, so that's so it's important to point out that's as far as they've gone on the record is basically um, and even the White House has confirmed that UFOs are flying around and they're real. But nobody has gone further than that, talking about the the, the occupants of these things. Right. <laughs> and but in this talk, Carl Nell. Well, first of all, he mentioned two other people. And I want to play another clip because it's important to know. Uh, you know, Grush, Elizondo, Mellon, uh, Rubio, Schumer, they all are on the record basically confirming UFOs are real and they're really serious yeah. and there's something to do with them. But he mentioned the Canadian uh, guy, politician, and the Israeli defense, former defense minister. And those guys have said more. They've gone way further. And I've got a clip here from three years ago. Uh, this is a news report um, about what the Israeli space chief said after he retired. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm going to play this and we can uh, we can talk about how far this pushes it, because he's Carl Nell is basically saying all of these people are telling the truth about what they know. But this Israeli space chief, he went a little further than just UFOs are real. Wow. OK. <laughs> The big question, has the state of Israel made contact with aliens? Well, according to retired Israeli general Professor Chaim Eshed, the answer is yes. Eshed served as the head of Israel's space security program for nearly 30 years, and he says that Israel and the U.S. have both been dealing with aliens for years. Now, to clarify, this by no means refers to immigrants. Eshed is clarifying the existence of a so-called galactic federation, and the 87-year-old former space security chief told Israel's Ynet News that lots of agreements have been made between the aliens and the U.S. to try and research and understand the fabric of the universe. Well, apparently this has all been kept a secret because humanity isn't ready. And if true, it would coincide with U.S. President Donald Trump's creation of the Space Force as a fifth branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. Apparently, Trump knows about the aliens, too. Well, we have our correspondent, Ariel Levin Waldman, joining us to break down the veracity of this report. So first of all, Ariel, give us a breakdown of the most shocking revelations that Israel's former space security chief has made here. Well, you certainly covered the most shocking ones. The claim made by Professor Chaim Eshed is that we are not alone in the universe, and not only are we not alone, we're not even alone on our own planet. The claim is that we have been visited by extraterrestrial life who have set up a joint base of operations with the United States on Mars, buried beneath the surface. He also claims that astronauts from the United States have been to Mars and are working alongside the extraterrestrials at this Mars base. This in addition to the claims of a galactic federation, which interestingly enough, echo statements made in 2005 by former Canadian Defense Minister Paul Hellier about visits by extraterrestrials to Earth as well. Very shocking statements, but extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. 
Right. Well, you, you mentioned he talks about the secret underground base on Mars where there are American and alien representatives. I mean, Eshad has a serious background. This is a serious guy. Should we be taking his revelations seriously? In the absence of such extraordinary proof, it's very difficult to take any of these claims seriously, at least not at its face value. One of the things you have to look at is just the laws of physics making things very difficult given the sheer size of space. Okay, that's enough of that clip. Mm, wow. Well, that was, that was when I, this, I guess apparently, um, I guess it was about three years ago when I first started, you know, realizing uh, UFOs are real, therefore aliens might be real and just started researching this. This was one of the first news clips I came across. And I just, and I started my alien playlist and this is the first video in it. And oh, I was like, okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so That's I was like, to okay. get you going. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, this was like, okay, here's my mark in the sand. Apparently. Well, and also it made sense to me if this was true, then some, you know, some old guys who retired would like be spilling the beans on this. And uh, here's an example of that. A retired elderly, retired high-ranking military guy from another country spills the beans and the whole world ignores it, you know, but it does get a little, but I mean, this is way more than Christopher Mellon, Grush and all that he's saying there yeah. is a space force. We have a base on Mars with aliens and there are treaties. That's unbelievable. And that we have our astronauts already on Mars working with mm -hmm. them underground. Yeah. So this, this is an ex Israeli space chief that, I mean, this is just mind blowing. Yeah. What year also, was this? Yeah. This well, this is from three years ago. Um, I don't know if it does it tell me the exact December 9th, 2020. This news report was out. Wow. Also interesting that it's Israel. Yeah, that is interesting, isn't it? I mean, they've they're probably working with the aliens. Yeah, well, it just I mean, it's it uh I, I've brought this up before, but it's interesting if you look at who does the United States work with in space. Um and, you know, it's it's actually if you look, there's never been an Israeli uh, um, astronaut that's gone up. The only Israeli astronaut that ever went up into space, uh, that space shuttle blew up. Oh, but yeah, I believe I got that right. Um, and then uh, but, you know, you know, the U.S. goes up into space with Russia all the time, but it doesn't mm -hmm. allow China or, you know, Korea or certain countries to go up into space with them. But Russia, we claim to be like enemies with but they, we're up in space with them all the time yeah oh, the, the politics are so you know nobody knows what's going on behind the doors you know <laughs> yeah it's uh i don't anyway so um yeah and you know this one that we uh well first let's go let's finish this what else you got so on this well um let me see i well i, I think i do have another clip uh pulled up and i guess this is he, him saying this is the part where he's talking about why are they not disclosing? So I might as well, why don't we go ahead and play this? Um, yeah. Because he gives a good summary. I think I've got this queued up, right? Needs to be brought into this topic in order to make progress and to improve society. And, and so all three of those things together trump the six other reasons for non-disclosure. Oh, exactly. And, and this may pose a threat to humans, yet you still believe that we should disclose. Is that right? Correct. Right. So... So there's really three reasons that trump all those others. And those others are basically valid, like I said. So the first issue is the moral right. The, the government exists for and by the people. And so the nature of reality is fundamentally not government information. People have a right to know the world in which we, we live, and the pursuit of happiness requires that knowledge. So that's sort of the first kind of overarching philosophical foundation for this. But, you know, as a corollary to that, if there are misdeeds that were done, then they need to be remediated. If there's lack of proper oversight, which is suggested by some of the whistleblowers, that needs to be remediated. So the first issue is the moral issue. The second issue is being in a reactive mode is never preferable to being in a proactive mode. So a reactive mode is basically trying to prevent disclosure. But Failing that, you might get a situation where you have catastrophic disclosure that creates all the problems that you were trying to prevent. So a more balanced middle path of controlled disclosure is the best way to do this, which is, again, an argument for some amount of disclosure. Okay, so that's where he was talking about why there, there should be a controlled disclosure. 
right. uh, earlier in the video, he talks about the six reasons why disclosure is not happening. And basically the, you know, one being, you know, the national defense military issue, because right. this is definitely relates to military power and national defense. And then and he says the, that kind of overarches all the other ones. That's that's like on yeah. top of all of them. So. Yeah, that's that's the thing that sort of like is weighs heavily, heavily on the minds of the Pentagon and all the people in power, in addition to it, you know, causing a potential massive disruption or collapse of a lot of parts of civilization, whether economic or or military or social disruption. Right. Um, which are all I mean, he's right. Those things might the lack happen. of a plan. Yeah. So the lack of a plan, <laughs> I remember, was one. So, yeah. Yeah. Serious. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's that's Carl Nell. And it's like, gosh, it's so remarkable how far we've come from our UFOs real to so much high ranking, credible, you know, people putting their careers, reputations on the line saying, yes, they're real. And there might be treaties between uh, you know, some governments and aliens that have not been told, and there might be some serious misdeeds, like right. wrongdoing, criminal acts, murders, you know, misinformation campaigns, uh, wars, who knows, some really, and he talks, Nell talks about that too. He's like, the problem is once you confirm this, it opens a can of worms, like a domino yeah. series of revelations come out that some of which are going to upset uh, people and things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Lord. What kind of treaties? I mean, what are they taking? You know, are they taking people? Are they taking minerals? You got to wonder. And and this guy, uh, Carl Nell, he's saying this is a, a moral crisis. You know, we've got to have we need to be aware of what's going on. Yeah, it's big. Yeah. So this is uh perfect timing for the uh, next class that I'm I just started, had my first class. Um a first of another a four class series with Richard Dolan yesterday. And this one is titled uh, alien agenda. And it's, it's all about his speculations of what could the alien agendas be oh, um, wow. and what, who are the aliens? And this uh, I wanted to talk about this with you. Cause it's really, re it was really fascinating. Um, so, I mean, I guess, let me frame it this way. The first thing that is most fascinating is Richard Dolan, uh, you know, he's like the premier historian of ufology. And he is, he's extremely, he's a, he started as a super skeptic when he got into this and he's rigorous and he is evidence-based. And I can just summarize, this is where he is in this whole picture. He is, he's like Daniel Sheehan and others. He's, he confirms there are, there seems to be definitely at least five types of aliens the small grays, the tall grays, the reptilians, the insectoid or mantid aliens, and then human looking aliens. And he really talked, there's a lot of reports of human appearing aliens. And so that he, he, um, he confirms, and he is highly suspicious that there are secret agreements between the U S government or somehow governments, world leaders and the aliens. And he also believes, you know, that these things have been around since for at least a hundred years. But this is the fascinating thing. And this was so glad someone asked him yesterday. He is completely, uh, his brain has not allowed him to, to see the aliens be here beyond a hundred years. Like he does not, I mean, he, he, he sees the evidence of the ancient pyramids and some of the ancient megaliths, but he is not convinced by any of the ancient Sumerian stories or all the theories of ancient aliens, ancient astronauts. Um, and so it's, it was like a really interesting disconnect because his, because he only really sees the alien phenomenon and the UFO phenomenon starting a hundred years ago, he is sort of locked into this vision of seeing the secret held within the national security state of the world. And I just find that sort of a fascinating limitation. He always, when he's talking about the secret keepers, he's always like the national security state, the national security state. And uh, I, my brain doesn't go there because I see that this has been thousands of years. 
they've been here a long time and the national security state has not been here thousands of years this is a right. this is something that's been sitting behind humanity for a very long time and it, that so that goes into some sort of secret world government or a network of secret societies and royal families or some things or churches um hiding it but he his brain doesn't really go there and so i just sort of found that uh fascinating um the limitation there yeah it's kind of limiting but you know we'll we'll take what we can get right i i know uh graham hancock is also at least officially i think unofficially he has you know more out there um theories but officially he believes that all of this is coming from civilizations that had existed here pri uh, previously that have been wiped out he's he's not taking the jump into ets yet so <laughs> i think mm -hmm. personally he might but officially he's being careful not to say it which is yeah. a, which is unfortunate because he's got a he's got a big following and a lot of influence so, you know, if he could start, you know, acknowledging publicly that this is real, at least, you know, as far as he believes, I think it's important because this is this is not we can't keep sweeping it under the rug. And that's another thing this guy Nell said. He said, we just we've been here before. We've tried to do these disclosures. Um, did you pick up on that part of it, Matt? What part? What do you mean? You know, where he was, uh, this guy, Nell, mm -hmm. uh, was saying, this is not the first time we've tried to to disclose all of this. Um, it almost made me feel like what he was saying was the public just doesn't seem to to want to hear it or isn't ready for it or something. Um, yeah. Well, there have been sort of cycles, like with Project Blue Book, and there have been sort of um, cycles where this has come up, and then the, the misinformation government suppressors have been able to put it back in the bottle. Um, yeah. 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 And they, they put Schumer back in the bottle too, didn't they last year? He Didn't he? And um, what's the other guy in the Senate? Marco Rubio. Rubio. He uh, didn't, they come up with some kind of a plan for, you know, or a request. Um, oh yeah. The UAP disclosure act, which yeah, yeah, yeah. it didn't get, you know, fully passed, but it, uh, you know, a bunch of it did get passed, just not the teeth. Um, and it's not like Rubio and Schumer have, uh, you know, they haven't stopped supporting this. So it, it's, in, yeah, it seems, I mean, I think there's, I don't think there's any putting this back in the bottle now, unless they do, unless something catastrophic happens, like a world war, um, something just like that devastates society, um, yeah. could really slow this down, but so what yeah. else did Dolan? Uh, so he he won't go more than a hundred years back, right? You're, well, uh, he does believe that it, it could be a breakaway civilization. He's totally open to that. I mean, just one of the things he said, he just doesn't find all the legends of you know he doesn't believe what's been said about the ancient Sumerian text so much or ancient Hindu texts. Um, he and for some reason he doesn't believe there's descriptions of gray aliens past a hundred years. He's just like, I, he's just like, he's never seen, he hasn't seen anything that shows anyone describing something that looks like a gray alien beyond a hundred years. So he's like, maybe those are new to our neighborhood in some way. Mm. Um, so I was just sort of, you know, um, I don't know. It's just important to me because if you want to try to figure out, what is going on you do need to figure out the agendas like if if they're if they're here flying around in ufos why are they here what do they want from us if there's treaties what are in the treaties what is it they um are getting out of this and if you're only thinking about this in terms of the last hundred years it's just going to limit your thinking you got to think about this in terms of like thousands of years in terms yeah. of why would they be here for thousands of years and why would they interact with humanity in the ways it appears they've interacted like you know I'd, I'd like to go back to the pyramids and to the pyramids all over earth and you know it if you go with the premise that clearly super advanced technology <clears throat> was used to build some of these pyramids and megaliths and carve some of these things and if you, you know, there's either humanity was super advanced back then and we've never figured out how to build these things again, or there's a 
alien society that was using their technology to help build these things. Why? Why did they build them? And then why did they let them go to ruin and not maintain them or repair them if they got damaged in a giant flood or something? Why, why would they go to all this trouble to build these incredible cities with incredible stone monuments that could last thousands of years, but not maintain them and maintain whatever civilization of humans was built around those. If, if they were like the gods of these civilizations ruling humans, why did they stop? Why did they go? Yeah. Underground? Well, the one theory I've heard was that they left because they saw the devastation coming from the younger Dryas period, which was, I can never remember. I think it's 11,800 years ago. And that this is kind of a cyclical thing that we go through. And somehow they, at that point, um, were able to leave the planet and then <laughs> leave everybody here to deal with it and get wiped out for the most part. And then now they're coming back. So who knows? Maybe they are going to reboot the pyramids Um it's fascinating. To, I mean, that's one theory. I, you know, who knows? Um, it yeah. makes sense to me. But why Especially, would they? Sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, why would they leave for so long? I mean, obviously, why would you know if the if there was some sort of massive flood? I mean, once the flood receded, why not just come back and rebuild if there was something right. of value here? Yeah, the other theory about that was that Nibiru is on such an elliptical orbit that when they left their planet, I guess, was close and they could leave. And then they've just gone around the whole orbit and come back around again. And I guess it's an 11 some year thousand cycle. That's a theory. That's so that, I'm so, th so that I put that in the category of they had to leave, like something physically forced them to either leave or go out of sight. Or here's Nibiru. another one is that because that planet cycles around in its elliptical orbit, that every time it gets near to us, it's what causes the catastrophic events in a cyclical pattern. Um, that's another theory that, you know, every time it circles around and comes close, it's disruptive to our planetary core and things happen around us in space and we get pummeled by i don't know what uh and that might happen that's a theory yeah which is a problem because if it's coming back you know we're getting ready for more earth changes i don't know yeah yeah i mean uh elizabeth april i've mentioned before she's a uh one who does remote viewing and speaks to aliens all the time and right, yeah. he claims they took her back to ancient Egypt and showed her when the uh I guess it was the Anunnaki and the reptilians were enslaving humanity and she says the one day the Galactic Federation showed up and said you can't do this anymore humans have advanced the two uh they're too intelligent you can't enslave them anymore and the uh Which she makes, says yeah. go ahead I well she said the reptilians then uh agreed to go underground and to not ever be seen or directly enslave humanity anymore, but they refused to leave because they said they, they were here before us and they mm. had a right to the planet. You know, it makes me wonder deeply about these so-called treaties that certain groups of humans have made with certain groups of aliens. I mean, if there's five different species here, we may have five different treaties going you know, with five different intentions, uh, different kinds of species with different intentions. Uh, who, gosh, so what do you think they want? What do we, what are these treaties, do you suppose? Well, I mean, first of all, there's the, there is a lot of reporting that the, there was a treaty signed by Eisenhower with the gray aliens that involved giving them the right to abduct humans on some sort of regular basis and supposedly i mean this is all just a floating around ufology i'm not sure there's any sort of like solid source for this but it's pretty freaking big nightmare that one yeah yeah and supposedly the treaty says that they had the right to abduct 
some humans, as long as they returned them where they got them and they were supposed to report to Majestic 12 or something, the list of who they were abducting each year. But they they said they have uh, they have not been doing that, apparently. But um, and that was in exchange for some amount of technology um, being given to uh, the U.S. government. And don't know if that's valid, but one thing that fits with that is the UFO crash retrieval program, you know, and that if there was a treaty be t between some part of the U.S. government and the aliens that involved an exchange of technology, that would really explain why so it seems so many ships were just dropped off and left perfectly functional for the government to come and grab because there's tons of reports that they have functional ships. Bob Lazar says he saw a fully functional UFOs or flying saucers at area. And these 51. were not made by humans. These not were made by humans. Wow. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, and David Grush said the same thing that they have fully intact working uh, vessels, I believe. Mm. Um, and others, uh, Lekatsky, who says he was apparently an insider working on the program that, uh, George Knapp and uh, Jeremy Corbell interviewed, and I think George Knapp wrote a book with, said they have a fully intact craft that uh, they've been inside. Wow. So it's, uh, but yeah, I mean, that would make, I could see the aliens, you know, saying, we'll give you every year, we'll give you a couple of craft, maybe we'll crash a few, maybe we'll land a few and just give them to you, but we're, we'll make it, you know, we'll do it that way so that it's ambiguous and unclear that this is a a technology exchange and uh it's a way of delivering craft to whatever this secret part of the government is but yeah. but it's you know who knows so my theory is that there are certain alien species that have treaties um that are more probably not so nice right i don't know maybe like raising for cattle, you know, I don't know. Those are the bottom line. Then there's probably another species who perhaps is interested in other things on this planet. I mean, there's probably other, a number of other species that are more interested in what's going on around us rather than humans. But I also wanted to go back to Carl Nell's uh, in, uh, interview at, at place 13 minutes, because that's where he says something in my mind, really fascinating about religion. Oh yeah. Um, did you catch that at the 13 yeah. minute point? You want me to play it? Would you? Yeah. stuff. Roswell became a meme a long time ago. We got programs on ancient aliens, Skinwalker Ranch, all this stuff. I, I guess I would draw an analogy, though, for people that uh, believe in a certain faith tradition, whatever that faith tradition is, and hold to that and subscribe to that in a very let's serious there. and devout way. What does that mean? He's saying, whatever your religion is, you better hold on to it. And then afterwards, he's saying, we're going to move from believing into knowing. And that kind of, if you keep playing it, that's what he said. I had to go back and listen to it a couple of times. So in a way, I'm understanding this. Tell me what you think, that he's, he's saying that there is, I don't know if it's all the extraterrestrial higher consciousness is, uh, is all the ETs, but there's at least this one he's referring to that is going to be what he calls a sea change in perception. And uh, and he says, it's, it's what we've always been believing in. You better be ready for it to be not just belief, but you're going to see it. I mean, that's the way I interpret it. So let's listen to that again, and you give me your two cents. All right. You want me to just continue it from there? Sure. And, and you know, sort of pose the question, even for folks of that ilk, and I would count myself as one, if the, you're confronted with the reality of your religious belief system, like the reality of the metaphysical, uh, an angel, a, a messenger from God, what have you, that's going to be a sea state change in your, in your way of dealing with reality, right? Even though you already believe it, right? So it's one thing to believe and it's another to know. And I think in this context, this this phenomena has uh, an analogous, the potential for an analogous effect, both on the individual and on society. Yeah. Yeah. Big. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That is, 
that is really uh profound it's yeah it's come up uh it, it came up when tucker carlson and joe rogan were talking about this um you know it's starting to as people that are religious who believe in god angels demons uh jesus uh and you know if you're islamic uh believing in jinn it's one thing to sort of believe these things it's another thing to actually see uh what seems like a supernatural being and whether it's you know i mean it's basically it's 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 uh touching on the point that if you don't have a religion you might see aliens as just another but incredible life form but if you do have religion they might fit into your mind as a supernatural being like an alien like an angel or a demon or a god yeah and i and i would add that it's the higher consciousness too it's that state of being that is you know that that sees more that has more wisdom that has a bigger understanding of everything that you know because most religions, that's what they're all about, are these God figures that have a greater understanding of everything. They know, they create us, you know. These are the gods that he's referring to. And he says, get ready to, to just not not believe, but you're going to know that these these are real and they're, they're here. And I guess that means we're going to potentially meet the gods that created us. It's 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 uh, big what he's saying. Yeah, Richard Dolan said something like this uh, in the class yesterday, saying um, that people have to be careful what they wish for because right. a, a lot of people who have actually encountered these non-human intelligences are pretty terrified right. because they are so much more powerful, and in um, their minds are just they they they're intelligence and power just sort of dwarfs people to a point that people feel like animals like you know like dogs yeah i think he yeah. said when in when the presence of one of these and um it sort of lends itself to the uh the, the image that kept on coming up for me during the talk with richard dolan was just the zoo metaphor um it's clear the galactic federation and all the non-human all these advanced aliens are they they in some way they're treating earth the same way that we would treat a uh like a safari preserve you know it's just like we let the yeah. they let the humans and maybe there's some reptilian aliens living underground here or or some alien but they basically are letting you know whatever happened inside this preserve happen let us kill each other war fight you know, whatever but they're not letting us outside of it. And they're just sort of watching us from the other side of the glass until they think it, it's going to work. But why would you go into I, the thing that images kept coming to my mind was like a, like a zoo chamber with like hundreds of uh, chimpanzees inside of it. And some of them were killing each other, but it's like, why would you go in there and try to talk to any, if there's, if they're in there murdering each other and you could right. talk to one group, but then there's other groups that are just like, flipping out and uh there's no peace or organization so it's almost like pointless to try to go in there and try to communicate and talk to them right yeah and and the senses that i'm getting too and i and i feel it myself is that the communication and because it comes through meditation is really getting strong that you know there is a practice of meditation that's ancient it goes way back in india called insight meditation, where if you silence your mind enough, you know, in complete uh, nondescript being uh, of yourself, then, then suddenly you suddenly get this aha moment. It's like a memory just pops in and they call that insight meditation. And right now it would appear that this is happening more and more you know, and you can say, well, maybe that's because their planet is getting closer. I mean, we can go off on all kinds of scenarios, but um, I do feel that this this wisdom is accessible now to probably most people who uh, want to meditate and quiet their mind, just clear, you know, it's like blowing all the dust through a straw. When you clear it out, there's room for something else to come in. 
So, um, yeah, there's definitely this higher extra, I don't know if it's extraterrestrial, but it's a higher intelligence coming through. Yeah, and, and that's why I was wondering about different species. Um, now, I, I've i heard several theories about this higher consciousness that in Hinduism, you know, there's the two concepts of Vishnu and um, Shiva. And Vishnu, well, they both have avatars that get reincarnated into the world on, you know, periodically when we need it. Uh, and what I mean by avatar is um, this god Vishnu will take on a physical form. And that's, there's been Ram and Krishna and, uh, gosh, I don't have them all memorized, but there's a list of them under Vishnu. So Vishnu comes back in a kind of repetitive way, taking on different avatars. And so does Shiva. Now, my guess is that these are a certain species of alien, um, Vishnu and Shiva. It, uh, who knows? It could be Enki and Enlil, you know. But it's from them that they come back into the earth and they take on physical form with a body and interact with humanity when when we need them or when they have some direction they want to steer us in. Uh, so... If this is what we refer to as the the you know return of the Messiah, then that's a very interesting. I mean, this all this seems to want to come together. You know, this guy talking about religion and get ready to meet him, and you know, what's your take on that? Well, it seems one image that seems to make sense to my mind is that there's there seems to be at least two major uh alien sort of factions one that seems in my brain it, it seems like one is sort of the draconian um really militant authoritarian sort of faction that sort of fits with like the old testament god and then one that seems from the ufology seems to fit with what they say about the Pleiadians, which is a more enlightened uh, peace and love focused sort of group that there is some that say the Pleiadians occasionally incarnate in human form, like perhaps Jesus and maybe others, like you mentioned in the, in Hindu. Yeah. yeah. And, and so it's, it seems, and it seems that that sort of fits with history that there's these, one force trying to teach authoritarianism and really rigid punishment and another that is trying like Jesus, you know, the, the Pleiadian sort of like teaching love and enlightenment and reflection um, and uh, Buddha, um, you know, sort of. Uh, so it, it seems, I mean, that sort of fits to me, that sort of fits and it, you know, perhaps one group is actually, living here on earth with us and there so maybe they are more integrated and dominated maybe the pleiadians are part of the galactic federation and they occasionally you know you know try to they've been trying to like you know teach us by taking human form i mean that that's, that seems like it fits with what's been happening yeah i i kind of have felt that too that that it, this could be the pleiadians you know i mean it sort of fits the description from what i understand that the pleiadians would fit the description of um enki on that on that side of the of sumerian history and also vishnu on the side of hindu religion so uh yeah i i think there's two forces working here but I don't really know what the treaties are, do you? I mean, I want to know. I don't know. Well, are we in danger? Who knows? Well, I think, you know, I, like, I think we're just, we're, we're still in the zoo. And so they're just sort of like, you know, they, if you're outside of a planet and the planet is in a, basically a state of chaos because there's multiple factions and powers, you know, and you're a super powerful alien race. Who are you going to make? Who are you going to talk to? You know, the all you can do is talk to the most powerful 
groups on the planet, the representatives of those. And if those most powerful groups on the planet are not telling the rest of the planet the truth, but but they're the ones with the spaceships able to go to the moon and actually talk to you, that's who you talk to. So I think, you know, they, there is potentially, you know, there's some sort of agreement, but, but from, from outside, you know, you can kind of forgive them for just talking to the most powerful group on the planet. But if you're on the planet, you may not even know who that most powerful group really is. And that's the position you and I are in. We, it's not, I, I don't think it's the U S government. The U S government is just a, or a corporation on earth. Every, every nation is just a corporation, but I don't think we are aware of who the real corporate board of earth is it's something like the World Economic Forum or the Illuminati or the Freemasons or some, there's some secret council, I think, that is the true uh, government of Earth. And, and actually, Stephen Greer has talked about that. He has talked about that he knows who the board members are, the real board members of Earth. Oh, and my. He's not said you know, them out. Loud. I want to, I would like to bring in a different dimension too. It's a, so much of, of all of this is all about power. And, and if I were an alien trying to figure out what humans are and all I'm being presented with are these, you know, power figures that can blow everything up, it's not really getting the full picture. <laughs> You know, humans are so much more than that 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 are nothing can reflect that in these upper power stratospheres. I mean, we are artists, we are musicians, and we are lovers, and we come from a place of 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 connection and community, and we want, you know, wisdom, and we seek balance with the earth. You know, that's a whole other side of humanity that they don't see. They're getting this tiny little pinhole picture of the big, strong powers in the world. But that's not, that's like the oyster shell covering the pearl. Mm. You know, that, that's the way I see it. It's like, the, that's just the covering. That's the outer shell. And what we actually are is much more vulnerable we're, we're are you know as as creators and and artisans and explorers and uh so yeah unfortunately they're just getting this picture of of our hard shell you know the the military so called protecting everybody um well, I think I think that hard shell is actually not as hard as you know as you're describing I think okay. it's because I think the the hold that whatever this what, even the governments, I mean, I've, the, you know, the governments, I mean, in theory, the government of the U.S. only rules by the consent of the people. And I think that's why the secret government has to stay hidden, because if we knew they were really there and they were the ones really in charge, I think, I, mean, I think we would stop obeying and we would change. I mean, we would. And I think that's one of the reasons they don't want disclosure to happen, because they're worried that. The masses will be like, okay, we want a different system. Well, what does that mean to to not obey? <laughs> what does well, that mean? Turn off your computer? Don't pay your taxes? What yeah, does it mean? Just not pay taxes would be one. Oh. Not going to work. Not, you know, going on strike. I mean, that's what, uh, you know, if you, I mean, if we were living on an island and we found out there was just some some the guy in the big castle in the middle was just some rich guy bossing us all around. We could stop picking up his garbage, stop, you know, stop delivering food to his house and just they whatever elites exist, they exist because society continues to serve them and obey the rules that yeah. let them enjoy their lives. Have you heard about this? Um, it's the younger, I guess it's the Gen Z's now. They have figured out a new form of strike, and uh, and and this all started with the 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 uh, what is it the Met Gala thing, and and so what they do is they they took a list of celebrity names and shared it all over TikTok and said, you know, these are the ones we want to disconnect from, and so everybody 
unfollowed, unliked, stopped clicking on their stuff, stopped watching their shows. And it and and it affected things. I mean, when when people get together and decide to unfollow, you know, because that's become a real currency, you know, the clicks and the follows and the likes and the comments, that's a currency. And these kids have figured out how to unplug and just take somebody down. That's a strike. Yeah. <laughs> it's the, well, the new it's, strike. Yeah. It's all about, you know, organizing and connecting. And I think it's what the, you know, the the strategy for controlling the world is controlling the media, but the internet creates an uncontrollable media zone that allows humanity to, to really network and figure things out. And if they can't control it, it's uh, it's a problem for long-term strategies of c controlling earth. So yeah. it's like, I mean, I've, I've always felt this way about the internet, like the internet, that this is part of the cure for, to allow us to really become a society based on truth and wisdom and communication and collaboration. And, but it seems, I think we got to crack the, uh, the shell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. I agree. But, you know, I think the ET consciousness is, is maybe on the, on the most superficial level, working through treaties with the military. But on the, as I said, with a deeper level, they are making direct connection to human beings. And all we have to do is quiet our mind and, and not to go searching for some, you know, cause our, our imagination can certainly jump in and get carried away. But if you can really meditate and go into that spacious, empty, gap, which is what Deepak Chopra calls it, um, you know, you can actually start to receive these inner messages. And these are coming from a higher consciousness. And now we could say maybe this is the, you know, the um, the return of the Messiah, the energy, the high consciousness, that love. Because when you make that connection and you start remembering, it's just like, oh, wow, what, what was I worried about? Mm. <laughs> so... Yeah. So I would still, I encourage everybody to find that quiet, deep, peaceful place and just create a room in your own inner sanctuary so that you can begin a dialogue. Well, with that, shall we do a, a closing meditation? Let's do it. So let's go ahead and get comfortable. I'm just going to ring the bell. So we want to begin to turn our attention inward. This is where we want to start creating a little space in our heart or wherever we feel most secure and comfortable and safe and just begin to breathe into it, just breathing into this beautiful, spacious place that we're going to infuse with a welcoming warmth and we're just going to sit there breathing in and breathing out and what we're doing is we're finding that razor's edge that sits right between future and past and the way we know that we're there is because we can tune into our senses, things that are coming in, stimulus that's coming in through these nerve endings, sound, smell, touch, all of it. And let's add to that thoughts. Thoughts are also a sense. Thoughts are generated by the mind like saliva is generated by the mouth when you give it something to chew on. And it's, it's possible to just watch it happen. Watch thoughts coming up and leaving. Another thought comes up 
and passes away. And sometimes they gather momentum and you can watch that. And then you can choose to turn your attention back to your breath, whatever you want to do. It's a mental exercise, learning how to not just be aware of our thoughts and our mind and our body, but how to control them actually. When your mind is going on a whirlwind excursion of imagination, especially if it's a fearful trend, you can watch it. Just watch it. See where it, what is that doing? What is it doing in my body? You can feel your pulse increasing or your breath getting shorter. Every emotion we have has a corresponding reaction that's occurring in the body. You just got to go find it. Maybe it's a tight jaw, tight shoulders. Kind of like just hunting around to find out where the tension is stuck. So let's just sit for a minute and do that. Breathing in, breathing out. Just notice it. And when the mind becomes very quiet, without any expectation at all, you might receive a memory. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Dora. Have a great week. You too.